Hi and welcome. Oh, how the years go by, right? The Aero Show in Friedrichshafen is back at the Lake of Constance, where the borders of Switzerland, Austria, and Germany meet. But also the European GA community is coming uh, together here year after year. And again, as always, this show is uh, where you see the highest number of innovations and highlights in the general aviation industry. And I'm uh, very, very excited to be here again. So this year, other than last year, this video will not focus on a specific segment. Instead, I'm trying to cover the hottest highlights and news that uh, I'll be coming across today. No matter whether it's uh, new airplanes, new engines, new gear or recent developments uh, with uh, regards to uh, sustainability, which as uh, in the last couple of years is a big topic here at Aero again. Follow along, it's going to be worth it. This video is uh, full of highlights and I always find it difficult to edit too much of the good stuff out because I'm sure people out there like it when they are presented with uh, some more in-depth information. If however you come across a chapter that might be less interesting for you, just make sure to use the chapter marks down in the timeline uh, below to jump to the next section you might want to find out more about. So we're getting started here today at the, the Rotax booth because uh, they announced a new engine this year and uh, I'm to get together with Mark here. Um, the engine is here uh, on this uh, shelf. Mark, tell me a, a few words about your new product here. Yes. So welcome to Rotax, welcome to Aero 2023. What you see here on my left hand side is uh, our new engine, the Rotax 916 engine, which is based on the 915 engine, but with a higher takeoff power of 160 horsepower, a little bit more uh, max continuous power, and that all with more efficiency at the same time. Um, now we already talked about this, Mark. Um, it, it's kind of based on, on the previous 915 IS, which had uh, about 140 horsepower. Um, what did you change on this engine to, to get the extra power? Because um, obviously from, from looking at it, it looks more, mostly the same as before. Uh, correct. Uh, the, the main difference is color and um, a little bit larger of, um, exhaust uh, muffler. Uh, from the outside, so you wouldn't see any more difference. In the inside, what we have is we did a recalibration of the engine, so it's a different software configuration, or software calibration, software mapping, which does most of the extra power and the different fuel economy. But of course, we have a, about a three dozen internal changes because we, we're offering more power at a longer time. We have a higher TBO of 2,000 hours and we have more torque at the gearbox. So there's a lot of little things you do to kind of uh, naturally evolve doing your quality improvement, but also to make sure you can handle that extra power. Um, now with the previous engines, they were kind of in the, in the classic two-seater segment, first ultralight, now even some certified uh, applications. What's the new kind of target customer group for the 916 IS? I think it will just follow along the path in, in terms of development what we already see with the 915. Yes, we will have very powerful two-seater. We have gyros who are capable of doing a lot of payload yeah. while not being more being like a big toy in the air in terms of drag. But we also see four-seaters already, like Sling is a very good example and there's a few more. This, of course, is even more sporty for a four-seater, so we will see quite some performance four-seater aircraft, which only by reading the 160 horsepower, you wouldn't expect it maybe at that level. But what we've already seen in early development with some of our customers, it will be pretty sporty with a very light engine. Uh, the first application we're seeing here and we'll be stopping by um, uh, JMB uh, in a couple of minutes is uh, the VL3. Um, this is now the even more the even more powerful 916 IS. Do you expect to see um, uh, not only the OEM segment but also STCs like maybe a 172? Or do you think there's going to be uh, an application in the four-seater segment there? Um, yes, I think we will see some of that. I mean, in the past we've already had one. We were already testing STCs on 152s. Um, I think, but it will be mainly driven by the residual value of the airframe versus the cost of a repowering. However, as you go up from like a 152 to a 172, the residual value all of a sudden is a much higher one. So it it makes naturally makes much more sense to actually think about STC. So I'm I'm pretty sure we will see a few coming down the line. Perfect. Now just for the for the people out there who haven't uh, heard much of the 915 IS, this is as the 915 IS. It's 
It's uh, liquid cooled. I think it it got it has got the turbocharger, so it can up go up to 16, 17, 1800 feet, uh, 18,000 feet, no problem. All right. Okay. It's uh, interesting. It's going to be interesting to see uh, how this uh, will be entering the market. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for your time, and uh, we'll be seeing the application of this now in the VL3. So let's uh, let's get over there. Enjoy, great time. So here we are at JMB Aircraft, and just in case you haven't heard of this company before, it's about time because their VL3, uh, built in the Czech Republic, is a bestseller in the ultralight category here in uh, a number of European countries. And as I know many of you are watching from the United States, the ultralight category is a nationally legislated class uh, that is in some ways uh, comparable with the US LSA segment. However, it is a, a little less restrictive in terms of the aircraft's complexity. So over here you're allowed to have a retractable gear, a constant speed prop, uh, which this has. And uh, that means it is a really high performance aircraft. In the, for now, most popular version with the Rotax uh, 915 IS with uh, 141 horsepower and the turbocharger, it will provide a similar cruise performance numbers as the Cirrus SR22 Turbo, for example. All of this makes the VL3 one of the most popular, if not the most popular, ultralight out there. 23 of these planes have been registered here in Germany uh, last year alone, which is quite impressive given that Germany is only about the size of Montana, for example. Okay, as promised, I'm now with uh, Lisa, who is uh, the face of JMV Aircraft here in Germany. I'm... Now, Lisa, um, behind us we can see um, your latest deployment of uh, the VL3 with the uh, Rotax 916 IS. We've been with uh, Rotax before, showed the engine uh, before at the Rotax booth already. Why does a plane who's already uh, had a lot of performance uh, in the, with the 915 IS need even more power? <laughs> uh, that's a good question, but actually the engine is not only about the performance, more power, it's actually also about fuel consumption. So of course the 916 IS with 160 horsepower has a, a wide better climb rate, the take of distance is much shorter, but, and this is the clue we have, um, we consume actually five liter less in the same power setting compared to the 915 IS. Now that's pretty awesome. I know a lot of uh, my viewers are from North America. Now this uh, plane is uh, usually certified or flown in the in the ultralight category. I explained that already. Um, if you wanted to buy this in in the United States or in Canada, what what are your options for now? Or are you even planning on an FAA or EASA Part 23 certification in this? Well, yeah, and as I know, and because I'm more responsible for the German market actually, uh, but it, it can be flown as an experimental in the States, and there are actually also quite a lot flying in uh, in the States already. So, but if you have more questions on that, also regarding certification in the States, uh, we're going to be at Oshkosh, of course. So, join the booth, have a coffee with us, and get more information. Now, as I read, the VL3 is not no, no longer the only plane in your in your lineup. What's uh, what's the news here? Well, actually, we last year we actually all already uh, brought this news to the market that we now are the builder of the Lance Air Evolution. So JMB Aircraft bought this project and is now responsible to build and to sell the, the plane uh, internationally actually. So most of the Lance Air Evolutions are currently flying in the States actually and in, in Europe they are some of them, uh, but we want to make this beautiful plane, I have to say that, uh, more popular in the, in the uh, European market actually. And uh, yeah, maybe some, some top facts, it's climbing, descending with 4,000 feet per minute, it's 300 knots uh, cruise speed, it's uh, about pressurized cabin, it's with the retractable gear, it's with the icing, so actually a quite perfect IFR plane, which uh, fits perfectly to the JMB family. But in Europe you can only fly this 
in VFR VMC conditions because of no. are they experimental? No, are it, is, it is an, uh, it is a, a November registered experimental, which can be in, in also on the European market yeah. be flown as a, uh, in IFR conditions. Oh, okay. There are some small details you have to take care of, but there there's yeah. not quite a lot. All right, Lisa, thank you so much thank for your you. time. Thank Wish you. Uh, you guys all the best. And I hope, I, I announced, I told this Lisa uh -huh. last year that I might be able to, <laughs> to come over to Eastern Germany and, uh, and fly this plane. I didn't manage it uh, for now, but I hope we'll be able to show this plane uh, someday soon here on the channel. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank all the so best much. to you. All the best to you. A quick update from Textron's Pipistrel, who again showed up with a big booth. Their fleet of the electric trainer, the Pipistrel Velis Electro, is growing and the product is still evolving. The second generation of batteries has been rolled out to almost the entire fleet. While the capacity is the same, the lifetime of the batteries has much improved, which an average a TBR of 1500 hours instead of a fixed value of 500 in the first generation. This means lifetime has basically tripled. Work on uh, generation 3 is meanwhile in progress. What's more, Pipistra showed their sleek Panthera, a high performance single that has been around for some time and is nearing certification. They anticipate this to uh, come next year. The Panthera will be equipped with the G1000 NXI then instead of the avionics here in this model. It also features a ballistic parachute and will be incredibly efficient giving its streamlined aerodynamics. This comes with a proven six cylinder Lycoming IO 540 which can be operated on unleaded MOGAS. If I had to bet I'd say that this will be the Mooney of the 21st century and the most serious competitor for the Cirrus SR series yet. I promise I will be doing a pilot report of the Panthera once certification is complete. This will be an exciting aircraft to review. The feedback from my test flight of the Diamond DA50RG from fall last year has been overwhelming. Make sure to check out this video as well in case you haven't seen it yet. The DA50 is however still awaiting FAA certification. I was curious to find out when this will finally arrive. Mickey from Diamond uh, was out there on the static display and told me uh, they expect this uh, very shortly and that we'd be talking about a matter of days actually. Lightspeed versus Bose. Both brands are famous in the uh, aviation industry for making uh, high quality aviation headsets. Their battle is entering the next round since uh, both manufacturers have uh, presented uh, new models in uh, the past year. We're starting here with the Lightspeed Delta Zulu, which is uh, their top of the line model. Um, it provides active noise cancelling, uh, great audio quality. You can uh, pair your phone or tablet using uh, Bluetooth. But there's uh, more features that are actually uh, pretty innovative and uh, that haven't been seen in headsets before. For uh, example, the new built-in CO monitor, CO sensor that will uh, monitor the level of carbon monoxide in the cabin and uh, give you an oral alert if uh, the level goes up too high. I love this idea because you normally um, normally wear your headset all the time when you're in the cockpit and when you have the engine running. That's a, that's a great safety feature uh, that will be more reliable than kind of the, the stickers you sometimes see in the cockpits. Um, the sensor will be powered by the battery pack uh, here in the control module, uh, in the control module, talking of the batteries, the Delta Zulu can take up either two regular AA batteries, or you can alternatively uh, power um, the your headset using a rechargeable um, pack that goes into the control module there, and you can recharge that, uh, recharge that using a USB power in case uh, the battery uh, there in the control module drowns out. Um, it should be. Uh, Good for up light speed claims it should work up to 30 hours though, so you definitely won't have to uh, recharge this every uh, every flight. There's more clever ideas. The Delta Zulu cables are connected uh, to the to the top of the controller, which means you can simply put that in uh, to the side pocket in the cockpit, so you have uh, less cables hanging around. Uh, that's uh, that's a neat idea, I think. The most important question though is uh, to find out whether this is actually comfortable or not. So uh, let me test let me test that for you. It's got a right and left I guess. That's going to be the right side.
So, uh huh. Okay, I can confirm it is. It is pretty, uh, pretty comfortable. It's, uh, it feels light on the head. It is. Um, it's, it's a good headset. I like that. Um, I've been uh, wearing the Bose 820 for the last couple of years. Um, it's hard to tell whether this is better or not, but it's definitely very comfortable and with uh, all the features it's uh, worth trying that on for yourself. But uh, we'll be finding out uh, more about the Bose lineup now, looking at the new A30. Now time to check out the competition, uh, which I'm pretty sure you've heard of already. It's uh, the new Bose A30. The reason I'm uh, saying you will have heard of this is because Bose uh, Bose has sent this headset out to all the bigger GA influencers who all uploaded their uh, reviews on the, the day Bose officially announced this uh, here at Sun and Fun in Florida a couple of weeks ago. I'm pretty sure the A30 will uh, again dominate uh, the, the headset market just because Bose is famous uh, for, for their comfort and the quality of their products. I owned uh, the Aviation X, the first of their uh, A&R Headsets. I've been flying hundreds of hours with the predecessor of this, the A20 myself, as I said, when flying privately as well as in the Boeing 777. I have to admit the A30 doesn't uh, have a CO monitor or these other, other clever features that uh, we saw with the light speed before, but Bose instead says that uh, the A30 now has a 20% uh, less clamping voice between the ear cups, um, but while provided, still providing the same uh, level of uh, noise cancelling uh, so this should be even uh, more pleasant to wear than uh, the A20 and uh, so both didn't send me a test unit so I'd consider myself pretty unbiased there let's give it a try okay this is I was <laughs> I was hoping I could uh, tell uh, tell you that uh, it's not much of a difference, but it is actually it is actually better than. And as I didn't, I should have worn this the other way around. Ah. Okay, yeah, it's uh, it is a huge difference on the comfort. It's uh, you you feel those uh, those twenty percent less uh, less clamping force there between between the ears. Um, but it's gonna be expensive, so the uh, light speed costs about, I think about 1,300. This even close to 1,400 euros. And I'm sure my wife will kill me if I tell her I, I need one of those now. But it is, if you don't own a headset for now, it is gonna be, it is gonna be a very, very good option. Bose A30 has my recommendation. Hi guys, now I'm uh, with uh, Dean, who is uh, the founder of uh, a brand Flying called Eyes. Flying Eyes. Uh, they produce uh, sunglasses specifically designed uh, for uh, the needs of a, of a pilot. Um, I can already tell that uh, it's uh, pretty slim here at the, at the ears. Yes. So. And you don't have to be delicate with it. They are unbreakable. You can oh, wow. bend them any way you like. They will That's not cool. break. It's part of my patent. Awesome. Yes. I've been a pilot for more than 25 years. I was tired of the problem of that, that pain under my yeah. headset and decided to do something about it. And I can tell that they, that they actually feel pretty comfortable. Yes. Um, I, of course, would need uh, the right pres prescription glasses yes, in here because uh, usually I wear either contact lens or, uh, or uh, uh, normal glasses. Yeah. And you uh, distribute those uh, we do. via Skyfox here in yeah. Europe? Yes, we do. All right. Yes. And I can tell. And I really like it. Um, there's an Austrian brand, and I used to, to have uh, these, but I think <laughs> I, that might be even better. Oh, yes. And they look pretty stylish. Yeah. So All, uh, all of our glasses are fit under helmets and headsets, and also motorcycle helmets. but. Uh, and all of them you can put prescription lenses into. Yeah. Also, all of them are non-polarized. All right, that's, that's good because uh, if you've ever worn uh, polarized uh, sunglasses, like there's many Ray-Bans out there who have uh, that pole, polarized uh, 
option you won't be seeing any any uh, of your screens anymore that's right so it's uh, that's a uh, that's, that's a pretty right. pretty neat feature there that's right all, all of our glasses also block 100% of ultraviolet light uv light is all blocked perfect and you guys uh, will be online under which website flyingeyesoptics.com flying eyes all right you guys heard that make sure uh, to to visit their site if you yes. if you need more glasses uh, new glasses for for your flying out there I then went to check back with BRM Aero, the manufacturer who built the Bristella aircraft. I've been giving you an overview of their EASA certified B23 in my aero coverage from last year and will be flying this plane for a detailed pilot report here on the channel within the next weeks. Subscribe to the channel in order not to miss this video. The segment covers the upcoming electric version of this plane. The prototype wasn't physically there this year, but it's still worth mentioning. The plane will be called the Bristel Energic. The entire electric drivetrain, including storage, is developed by a company called H55, a spin-off of the Solar Impulse project. The Bristel Energic is designed to fulfill a typical flight school mission, which is a one-hour training flight plus 30 minutes of reserves and a subsequent one-hour recharge of the batteries. It will ultimately be certified under the rules of EASA CS23, which should be finished in 2024. And it will then be the first competitor for the Pipistra Valis Electro. The basic airframe is no different compared to a standard B23. This means that the flight school could easily combine the Bristol Energic for initial training, circuit and maneuver training and the B23 for cross-country trips, as well as for rentals. We'll be staying in the world of electric aviation for a moment because I'm uh, very excited to uh, be able to show you uh, this yellow birdie behind me here. This is called the Electra Trainer and yes, at the first glance it uh, does look a bit weird, I'll admit. When I first saw this it kind of reminded me of a dolphin with a, with a pointy nose there in the front. But maybe I should uh, stop mocking this thing because um, this might very well be kind of a game changer actually. As its exterior suggests, the, this has been designed from the ground up to be an electric airplane. It doesn't need a long nose because uh, electric motors, electric engines are tiny and don't need that uh, much space. The wingspan is uh, a lot bigger, which means that this uh, whole thing will be much more efficient. And as we know from the car industry, an electric car that has been designed to be an electric car from the ground up is usually better at being an electric car than a normal uh, car with a combustion engine that has been uh, converted in or turned into an electric car. Again, I'll refer to the Velis Electro we saw before. Remember how this has been, or this had an endurance of uh, 40 minutes uh, plus about 10 uh, minutes reserves with its 22 kilowatt hour batteries. The battery pack in here has uh, 33 kilowatt hours, so that's 50% more than in the Velis. And now it's your job to guess uh, the endurance of the Electra trainer here. Nope, it's more than that, a lot more indeed. This plane can stay in the air for up to 150 minutes plus uh, 15 to 20 minutes of reserves. So you can fly this plane for two and a half hours excluding reserves. And that fellow aviators is, uh, is crazy. When I first read this number with my experience in the Pipistrel Velis in mind, I uh, thought this must be a mistake. This, this simply can't be possible. Not today, not with uh, today's uh, battery technology, but this thing uh, is reality. It's uh, not a computer model. Uh, it's not some sort of visualization of uh, something the world will never see in a fancy magazine or something. It's here, it flies. And uh, now I hear you saying, okay, Simon, What's the catch? Honestly, where's, where's the catch? Well, I'll admit there are two or three things we need to uh, put into perspective, actually. First, let's convert the endurance we learned about before into actual range. As you can see for uh, yourself, this has uh, a rather long wingspan, almost like a motor glide of some sort. This means it's uh, efficient, but also means it's not very fast. Cruise speed will be about 120 kph which uh, converts to about 65 knots. This means if you wanted to go places, your range would only be roughly 160 nautical miles. 
but this is not going to be the typical mission for this plane anyway. Instead, as the name suggests, it might be more suitable for uh, training usage. While this prototype has one center gear, the production models will have a bipod landing gear in a tail dragger configuration. It's for sure better than that center gear. I'm still not 100% sure if this is what the average flight school owner wants for a training device for his students. For now, this plane is only certified under German ultralight build standards anyway. Still, there's two more brilliant things I discovered that I want to share with you. Starting with the propulsion up front, because uh, this uh, thing doesn't have a single electric motor. Instead, it's, it's actually a twin. Yes, there are two identical electric motors, each rated 35 kilowatt, in, uh, that both drive the same propeller hub. Uh, this means that if the engine fails, or if one engine fails, the other is capable of uh, keeping you aloft actually, and even uh, give you a little uh, climb rate in that case. Also, the batteries and the electronic management are supposed to be uh, fully redundant. Another interesting detail is, uh, is the trailer over there, because uh, customers can actually decide to buy this together with their electro trainer. This trailer will have uh, solar panels on uh, its roof and a battery pack inside so you can actually put the entire plane into your trailer and then uh, charge uh, the, the plane inside the trailer from the uh, power pack that's inside. That's actually a, a neat feature because as I said uh, charging infrastructure is a bit of a is a bit of an issue with electric aviation and uh, this is kind of this is uh, one way to to solve this issue um, electra solar is actually uh, based in uh, southern germany close to where my family lives so i might even be able to visit the uh, the company there one day and maybe even do a test flight let me know in the comment section if you're interested in uh, this kind of content Welcome back to the good old world of steam and gas. I'm with Blackshape, an Italian manufacturer who is presenting the Blackshape Gabrielle BK160TR. I haven't been able to show any Blackshape on this channel yet. In many ways it's quite a bit different to other planes we've been looking at today so far. This is an EASA certified airplane. The TR stands for Trainer, which is the segment this is marketed in. With its tandem seating configuration, this set somewhat has the DNA of a military trainer. Then there's the engine. I promised steam and gas, so it's not a Rotax, but powered by a good old Lycoming IO320, providing 160 horsepower. This also means this will have a pretty decent entry level performance for students. I'm not sure about you, but I love the aggressive looks of this thing here with its engine cowling. Cockpit. How cool does this cockpit look? All Garmin in the core of the GE3X. Uh, touch here in the center. Garmin Autopilot, G5, backup and everything. Again here I love this military appeal of all the switches. Even though this is in no way practical for private usage and in no way what I'd be looking for when owning a plane myself, I kind of want one of these uh, just because it's so cool. A neat feature is this toggle switch in the back of the plane which will allow you to switch the configuration of the cockpit. You can choose between a solo configuration where the instrumentation in the back seat will uh, simply be turned off, a passenger configuration where it's all powered but the passenger in the back can't make inputs or changes and then a trainer setup where the student's inputs are in a way uh, fail safe. For example, the gear will only retract if both gear handles are moved upwards. Some numbers, typical cruising speed will be about 140 to 150 knots. Useful load is 220 kilograms only, which is really not a lot if you wanted to put in fuel for more than an hour or so. The good thing though is that uh, you won't be able to put in much more anyway, because the maximum fuel capacity is only 34 gallons. That's why the maximum range is only 400 nautical miles. Hmm. But this is designed to be a trainer and it's a bloody cool one if you ask me. Shortly before the closing time of error, I managed to get an interview with Casimir Pellissier, CEO of Roba Aircraft, because they announced something big here at Aero as well. Unfortunately, the battery of my external microphone had drowned out by the time. Apologies for the bad in-camera audio. Make sure to turn on the subtitles if required. So my last stop of the day is with the Roba aircraft. Um, some of you might have been following my channel for, for a couple of time. I did a flight review in a Roba DR-401 in the aerodrome of Baal in France. 
and I'm uh, together with uh, Kazimir, who is uh, CEO at Roma Aircraft. And uh, Kazimir, thanks for taking the time. Right uh, here behind us is uh, one of your Roma Air 401s, but it, it does look a little different uh, compared to the others I've seen before. Yeah. What's what's the big news? Yeah, the colors are very different, <laughs> <laughs> and of course the engine also. You can see that the, the nose is a bit longer, uh, so it could be a Rotax and maybe we'll have a Rotax in the future. But it's a turbine inside, as uh, you, can, you can see. Uh, it's a GP90 from Turbotech, which is a French company that has uh, motorized uh, GMB yeah. and, uh, and Bristol. Yeah. Uh, and now we are aiming at certifying this turbine. Uh, this is promising, uh, of course. Uh, this is a multi-fuel engine, means you can have a sustainable aviation fuel, you can put have gas, jet inside, you can mix them together, you can put tequila, gin, vodka, everything that burns uh, will work with the turbine, so it's a good option uh, because we know that air gas is going to disappear, and we don't know what will happen with UL91, and you can put automotive fuel, you can put anything. Yeah. It's uh, much lighter, so you gain 100 kilos of payload or yeah. options, why not put a parachute and still yeah. have 470 kilos of payload? So it's amazing. It's also very silent. It's also very few maintenance. Uh, so it means high availability of the aircraft. I mean, the pros are so numerous that we are we are just we have a, a new an, an incredible energy since we started the project. And all the team in, at Robin, the guy from the production, the guy from the offices, the guy from the accounting, everybody is let just into your side. It's really exciting. But but the delays three to five years to get to a certification. So it's tomorrow, but not really tomorrow, tomorrow. Uh, now to put things into perspective, as, as I said in the video about the DR401, um, the useful load in, in a plane of this size uh, was for about 400 kilograms in, in the DR401 with the diesel engine option. And uh, now you have 100 kilos on top of that, so it's going to be 500 kilograms with the TurboTech turbine engine. Yeah. Just to add uh, a little information, 400 kilograms for a DR-41 full AFR with full options. Yes. It means a lot of weight, otherwise for a BFR night uh, with no glass cockpit, uh, DR-41 155 is more, uh, 430 kilograms. Yeah. So 400 plus 100 is 500 yeah. kilos, yeah. so you can be uh, bigger, stronger and still fit in the aircraft. Now the next step still is the, the space we have in the aircraft. Yes. And you know, you may be noticed that at the back seats, yeah. it's not as comfortable. Yeah. The good thing is, with a light engine in front, yeah. uh, we'll need to put some weight forward. Yeah. So maybe it could be a good idea to take the rear tank and put it in front, yeah. keep the wing tanks, have a small tank in front, have 120, 150 ki kilos of uh, yeah. kilos, liters of fuel, yeah. and then we can do with the back seats, just lower them with two rear seats yeah. and have more space for the head at the back. So it's a lot of, of yeah. innovation that can come with this, this new And more ma maybe more baggage space because this is a little limited yeah. on the DR4. Yeah. Awesome, now... Okay, um, Julie knows yeah. <laughs> And then uh, there's the news um, that uh, Robin was, you call in France, in the uh, mise en sauvegarde, it's chapter 11 uh, uh, thing that was due to an AD you had to, with the wing spurs. I think Robin is about to exit this in this kind of condition, so yeah. work, yeah. Uh, work is, has continued and is still continuing. Yeah. So for potential customers, there's no reason to think or to worry that the Robin might uh, get into financial, financial problems, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think the first. Uh, the first, the first uh, thing to say is, if we had big troubles and we were like going bankrupt, as I could read in the magazines, yeah. we we would not be here and yeah. we would not be have such an aircraft, such a, uh, a stunt. I mean, the stunt is nice. Yeah. Uh, the team is very enthusiastic. I mean, the chapter 11 was a phase during uh, because caused by the uh, the wing spar issue that has uh, stopped delivering of the aircraft, so it stopped also the cash coming in and the cost kept on, kept on going. So for us it was critical that we act quickly, but the authorities also act quickly and the chapter 11 was 
um, the, the phase to protect the company from any customer panicking or uh, also a way to say to the authorities uh, we are in a difficult situation, please um, expedite. expedite in a way we have to act quickly but they have been totally supportive yeah. in that matter. So chapter 11 is the first phase and the second phase is uh, to show that uh, uh, our aircraft are well conceived and we want all customers to, to regain their full flight domain very quickly. It's, um, the objective is a horizon of uh, six to eight months to be able to say to the customers, you have your full flight domain again. Yeah. So, Perfect. very important. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, good news from Roba. I'm very excited to hear that. Thank you so much, Casimir, for the time and I wish you, Thanks to you. Uh, all thanks. the best. Thanks, thanks you. For, your, yeah. for, for your insights. Thanks. Again here a big thanks to Casimir for the interview. As you might know I really love their handcrafted wooden planes with the characteristic design and think their product is one that outperforms even many modern designs in a number of areas. After this part my day at Aero was over. I didn't even manage to do a proper outro because I had to rush to get my ferry back to the other side of the lake. But of course I'm very curious to learn what you found most interesting, what uh, you maybe found boring and to learn what topics or planes you'd like to see me cover specifically here on uh, my little channel. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed this film. There will be more videos here soon. For example a detailed pilot report of the Bristol B23 Turbo as mentioned before. So subscribe. Thanks for watching all the way to the end and as always many happy landings out there.